let's go session one uh, introduction to to assimilation uh, so from binary mixing to magma chamber simulator how has modeling how, how has assimilation been been modeled in igneo systems so uh like i said i i, I had a five-year project funded by the academy of finland uh, which initially was supposed to study partial melting processes in the contact sense of zones of layered intrusions, quite a specific subject. But of course, like, like many projects, it kind of like went to many, many other directions as well. One of the things was that when I started this project, there wasn't a publicly available interface of, of magma chamber simulator. So I actually took part in, in making that happen. So it would also be more easy for me to use the software, but also, of course, that that, that all, the, all the other geoscientists out there could get their hands to it. So I, I spent one year uh, in, in Central Washington University where Wendy Borson was, was staying at that time, and also in University of California, Santa Barbara with Frank Spera. And, and at, during that time, I actually developed the trace element equations for, the, for MCS, and, and of course, uh, took part in beta testing and developing the primary MCS software as well. So, I think that was time well spent. After that, I was just able to apply it to, to different environments. So, so that was the MCS team, me, uh, Frank, Wendy, and then there was a postdoc, Kieran Isles, who was here in Helsinki from, from Australia, University of Melbourne originally, who applied this to this tool to uh, uh, Lackland Foldbell Granites and is continuing, continuing that work today still in Helsinki. Actually, have moved onwards but got more funding to, to work in Helsinki using MCS. Einari Suikkanen was also a, a Finnish uh, postdoc for a short while who actually developed a visualizer tool for MCS which we are going to uh, be introduced today as well. So this is what we are concentrating on, on today this team and what we were able to pull out and, and kind of like give you an introduction of how, how MCS works. Of course we had other people in the team as well, Ferenc Molnar, uh, Arto Luttinen, experts on some specific intrusions, and then experimental team as well. Uh, Max Schmidt from ETH Zurich, and then uh, doctoral student Ville Virtanen, which you probably have, have heard about uh, in, in some meetings or, or about his latest publications about how black shale, uh, uh, black shale behaves in, in contact zones of layered intrusions when it's being heated by the magma. But that was a separate uh, part of this project. So uh, that's all about me and my projects. Let's go to the matter itself. So uh, what is assimilation? Uh, I think every one of you have some kind of idea what that means. Uh, uh, there's magma in contact with crustal or, or mantle. Uh, wall rock, magma invades cracks in the wall rock, magma may break off some rocks from the wall rock as xenoliths, some of them can melt, some of them uh, may be preserved, and the magma can also melt the wall rock into contact. Of course, there are many other processes that are happening, but maybe these ones are the ones that are, are like the first things that come into your mind. However, defining assimilation has actually not been very straightforward or in the geoscientific community. Uh, for example, in, in the first edition of the Glossary of Geology in 1972, assimilation was defined as the process of incorporating solid or fluid foreign material, i.e. wall rock. And, and to me, although I'm not a native English speaker, uh, this means that fluid can also be considered as, as wall rock, which sounds a bit strange. Uh, but anyway, uh, incorporating wall rock into magma. Such a magma or the rock it produces may be called hybrid or anomalous. Uh, I think today there are like a dozen other ways of calling magmas anomalous instead of them just being uh, contaminated by the crust. Anyway, I mean, things change and this is where it started. But the evolution of the term in, in the glossary of geology has been uh, uh, quite something. Uh, so in, in the latest edition, I think that has been published as a book. Uh, it says that assimilation is the incorporation and digestion of xenoliths and their chemical constituents into a body of magma. 
such a magma or the rock it produces may be called hybrid or, or contaminated. So this actually this definition of assimilation doesn't take account the magma, contaminate, uh, magma being contaminated in the contact. It, it only takes account the digestion, incorporation of digestion of xenolids, which is quite weird. But anyway, it's not easy to come up with these explanations. It's easy to miss something. It's easy to include something that is that it shouldn't that shouldn't be included. So we actually started looking at this because of these definitions. We, when we are modeling assimilation uh, using a tool, or we want to develop a tool that models assimilation, we want to know what assimilation is and how it could be defined. And this is kind of like a scheme that we came about during, during the project together with Frank and Wendy and Kieran and, and Mille and other people from University of Helsinki, kind of like trying to define what it actually is. So uh, on the left here, uh, you see two different entities, uh, A and B. And let's start with the B. Uh, B is, let's say, like a magma chamber or, or partially molten nigmatite or something where you have completely solid material, for example, here in the bottom, and completely molten material here on the top. And, and in between, you have, you have mixtures of, of crystals and, and melt. Now this uh, entity B, it gets intruded by completely uh, molten magma, i.e. melt. And this melt just go through, goes through this system. So what happens in the contact of, of melt with another melt uh, is different what happens in the contact with the melt with the completely solid material. And of course, everything uh, here in between is reaction between melt and, and melt and, and, and solid. So what we see here is, is this kind of traditional uh, magma mixing, uh, which also may mean several things depending on who you ask from. Uh, and assimilation are kind of like end member processes of kind of like the, 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 the same, not, not the same thing, but they are end member processes in between which we, we can have uh, like mixtures of these processes. So if we look at melt mixing with melt, both are initially completely molten. F is one, F is one. We have two melts mixing together. If they homogenize completely, we suggested that this could be called hybridization. So it creates one hybrid melt from two different melts. Uh, if they don't mix chemically, but they mix physically, this uh, could be called mingling, of course, which is a tra traditional term uh, for this uh, process. Now, some of you would call this mixing and this mingling, but we kind of like wanted to take stance that mingling is also mixing. It's just physical mixing and not chemical mixing. So we would uh, like put this under the umbrella of mixing these both uh, terms. So what happens here in the contact of melt and solid uh, material? If these are completely homogenized, uh, like here in the case of melt and melt mixing, uh, we would call that like the epitome of assimilation. Then if they don't mix, there are two options. The, the wall rock may partially melt, but the melts don't mix to the, to the uh, other melt, which is kind of like the same mingling situation as here. Or if there's not enough heat in the melt to, to melt the wall rock, uh, then this would be called stoping. So only solid blocks of the wall rock are, are introduced in that melt. A. So, so this is how we would define assimilation. Uh, end member mode of magmatic interaction in which an initial state, uh, meaning D0 here, that includes a system of melt and solid wall rock evolves to a later state where the two entities have been homogenized. So that's kind of like the epitome what assimilation is. Of course, one could also talk about assimilation of fluids, uh, but here we are talking about this more general mode of assimilation where solid wall rock is in contact with the melt. Uh, this, uh, how we went through this and, and where we basically, the, the paper about for, based on which this presentation has been prepared can be found in AGU Geo, uh, Geophysical Monograph Crystal Magmatic System evolution, and this is chapter seven in that one. And I think I distributed that in the papers 
that I sent you before the workshop. So if you want to know more about how we came about with these definitions, you can read it from there. And of course, in nature, we never find or very rarely find like these pure end member uh, processes taking place. Like this could be called hybridization. There are two magmas that came together and they kind of like mixed almost homogeneously chemically, but you can still see some isolated phenocrysts here. Uh, this is, of course, quite a good example of mingling on the field. If we find basalts, like here, continental fat basalts from Antarctica with epsilon neodymium value to minus 15, uh, they did not come from directly from any mantle source. They assimilated. Archean crust on their way to the surface. And, and we don't see any, uh, or very rarely we see any xenoliths in this basalt. So this has been quite a uh, complete assimilation process in these basalts. That's we, we can only show the basalts here because there's nothing else, else to see. And here an example uh, where we have mingling and stoping taking place. You can see there's a stoped wall rock block sitting there, like a gnasic rock or something like that and then two uh, different magmas that have been mixed physically but not chemically. So in nature, you find all kinds of variations of these end member processes. Probably this is something you already had in your mind when looking at these pictures. Crystallization uh, is, is not involved in our definition because we only wanted to define what is assimilation. But in nature, when uh, melts from the depths of the the mantle and depths of the crust are brought to the surface, uh, they start to cool, they start to crystallize. The assimilation as a natural process is, is basically, it doesn't happen without some crystallization in the melts. There's always some crystallization happening. Very rarely you have some kind of superheated magma that can dissolve uh, like wall rock or, or earlier formed cumulates without any crystallization. But the standard case is that there's something crystallis crystallizing in these systems. And that, of course, makes things more complicated. So uh, I think this is the, in, is the introduction, and it relates to uh, these different modeling schemes, which have been used. Of course, there are many other ones, but these are, the, I think, the most used ones, at least a collection of them. So everything started with simple binary mixing. Uh, you can see I have highlighted mixing there, because it's called mixing. Or, or it's called mixing equation, but it has been used to model, model assimilation, which of course is mixing of melt and water. But let's not go to this uh, semantics here too deep. Uh, and then a very highly used one still, still today has been a very important tool for many petrogenetic studies. The assimilation fractional crystallization equations of De Paolo from 1981. Uh, energy constraint assimilation fractional crystallization that was developed by Wendy Porson and Frank Spera before MCS was available. So it was kind of like a, a little bit lightweight version of, of MCS. We will shortly discuss that here as well. And then the tool that we are using today, uh, the magma chamber simulator. So let's see what is different in, in these models relative to each other. So uh, you can see the different uh, models listed here from binary mixing to, to MCS and the initial state uh, of that taken from snapshot taken from that figure that I showed you earlier, where we have melt uh, in contact with, with solid wall rock. And of course, uh, in, in assimilation, if we want to model assimilation, uh, uh, mass is, is being transported that way and heat is being transported that way. So we always assume, uh, or it doesn't have to be assumed, it can also be tested that the melt is, is hotter than the wall rock that surrounds it. So uh, in binary mixing, it's just bulk assimilation. So there's no crystallization taking place. You can just shove in as much wall rock as you like into the melt. Just put it in, put it in. <laughs> Nothing will tell you how much wall rock you can put into the magma and just mix it without any, any crystallization. Of course, this may give you some kind of hints on, on what was happening, but as a petrogenetic model, it's, it's not very strong. Uh, the AFC model of De Paolo, uh, 1981, takes account crystallization in the magma. So it's one step forward from, from binary mixing. 
But again, it's still a little bit troubled with the same issue. Nothing tells you how much wall rock you can put into the magma in the melt. There's no thermodynamic limits to it. You can just use any R value, R value meaning the mass of assimilation versus mass of crystallization. And, and that can be any number that you like. It's just maybe maybe something that fits your data could because nothing tells you whether that is energetically possible or not. Anyway, still very useful model because it takes about crystallization, which happens in natural systems. So you can also get some information uh, from petrogenetic systems with this uh, quite simple model. Okay, then we come into models that, that use thermodynamics. So kind of like trying to understand what phases are crystallizing. Uh, how much heat there is available in the melt to, to in the magma to melt the wall rock and so forth. So in ECAFC in, in MCS, uh, there's you can uh, first heat the wall rock, see even if it starts melting at all or if there's only crystallization taking place. There's partial melting starting if there if the wall rock is heated enough at some point. And if there's enough melt present so that it can percolate through the wall rock, it can then be assimilated in the magma. So you can already see that this is a little bit more complicated than the, than the traditional models. And of course, that means that the input and the tool itself, the code, and the output is, of course, much more complicated as well. And, and it's, it's just something that comes, comes together with these more complicated models. So binary mixing, I think I don't have to spend too much time with this. It's like mixing a, a drink. Just put these two, get, two, get two things together and, and see what comes out of it. Does not consider crystallization or thermodynamics. Uh, AFC equation uh, results for crystallization, but does not consider thermodynamics. And, and something, of course, what is important to say there, here is that because we are not considering thermodynamics and not considering phase equilibria, the, it is impossible to model that because we don't know which phases are, are crystallized. So this, is, this has only been designed for trace elements. Although, of course, if you want to model trace elements as well, you would like to know which phases are crystallizing. So you know which partisan coefficients to use in, in the equation, for example. But mostly this is just, you know, you pick up some partition coefficient values that are maybe relevant for your system, and you may test different uh, R values, meaning the amount of assimilation related to crystallization or, or so forth. So, uh, for example, element partitioning in the wall rock is not taken account here either. So again, it's kind of like bulk assimilation, just shoving uh, the wall rock into the magma unless you are, of course, using a partial melt composition as the assimilant, which is, of course, possible as well. But anyway, it's, it's bulk assimilation of whatever assimilant you, you decide, uh, decide to choose. So uh, then to these energy constraint models. So these then like tackle the question that how much energy is required to heat and melt the wall rock. Uh, they, uh, they are interested in phase equilibria at given pressures and temperatures, trying to model them, thermal properties of the magma and wall rock, and percolation threshold for the molten wall rock. So how much wall rock is, is, has to be molten in order for the assimilation to begin. So there's heat exchange, mass exchange, there's cumulate, uh, pile which crystallizes from the magma and in MCS and also in some versions of EC AFC you can have recharge events as well so new magma coming into the system which, which may be very useful in studies of, of different systems. In EC AFC which is also only a, a trace element model uh, phase equilibria at given pressures and temperatures is actually not calculated for individual steps so in ECAFC, the thermal properties of magma and wall, wall rock are considered as bulk values. So you give a bulk value for magma, how much heat is released from that while it completely crystallizes. And you give a bulk value for the wall rock that how much heat you need to uh, generate in order for it to melt. So this is kind of like a lightweight version of, of MCS and kind of like understanding how the, how the, uh, how the things change 
in every step of that assimilation process. Uh, but otherwise, otherwise it, it's, it's kind of like similar. But in MCS, uh, all uh, phase equilibria and how they change during that crystallization and assimilation processes are, are taken into account. So what MCS is, it models the effects of recharge, assimilation, and crystallization on phase equilibria, uh, mineral chemistry, major elements, trace elements, and radiogenic isotopes through mass and enthalpy balance in a multi-component, multi-phase magma plus ball rock system, utilizing the melts uh, engine. You can either select trilite melts or, or, or P-melts, uh, also different versions of R-melts if, if you so wish. So the thermodynamic engine behind MCS is the melt software that probably is the most, most used uh, modeling tool for, for igneous phase equilibria. It is nowhere near perfect, as probably many of you know. There are, for example, some issues with, with very water-bearing systems. And for example, systems that are very uh, carbonate-rich, it doesn't uh, produce those, those very well. But for certain kind of uh, systems, especially very common ones, it is actually uh, quite useful. Anyway, that's, that's, the, that's the setting that we have at this point. We are nowhere near complete with these modeling tools. There are hundreds and hundreds of different ways to go forward from here. For example, MCS doesn't consider kinetics as, at all. It doesn't consider like uh, zones in the wall rock so that you would have more melting close to the contact and, and less melting far away from the contact with the wall rock. It's not gradational. You are just melting a piece of wall rock completely. This is of course not what happens in nature, but we are getting you know closer and closer step by step, hopefully closer and closer, not farther and farther uh, with these methods. So from binary mixing uh, to AFC, and from there to MCS, and from there onwards somewhere else. Just a sketch, kind of like illustrating once more what is going on. We have a magma where uh, phase X is crystallizing in contact with uh, wall rock, where there is phase A, B, and C. Uh, latent heat and sensible heat from the magma is being transferred. To the wall rock. At some point, uh, partial melt starts forming. We may have another uh, phase forming in the wall rock because of the reactions. Another phase starts crystallizing in the magma. At some point, when there's enough melt present, uh, the melt gets assimilated uh, by, the, by the magma. And as a result of that, the melt composition, of course, changes. The magma composition changes. And we may again stabilize another new phase, solid phase in, in the system. So this is kind of like just showing what may be going on in your modeling scheme in, in MCS. And let's look at, uh, at this point, the graphical output of, of MCS. So you see uh, most of the output that used to come out from MCS when I started using it is, is only like, you know, endless line of, of Excel sheets. Which we, which we will look at today a little bit as well. But because we also developed this visualizer tool, there are also ways to actually look at what is going on into the system, not just go through all the Excel columns and, and rows, but just to have an idea of an overall view of what is happening in the system. So this is MCS visualizer. You can download this from the MCS website as well. Now, this is an animation. And this is the animation of the same run that we are running today. So two recharge events and a magma with initial temperature about 1,100 degrees, uh, heating and finally assimilating wall rock uh, that has initial temperature of 700 degrees. So it's already, the wall rock has been preheated in, in this scenario. And as you can see, there's not that much melt, initial melt, in the beginning, the wall, mass of the wall rock is twice twice that. But anyway, you see that something interesting will start happening when I start the animation. Probably some things that I should mention when I start the animation is that what you will see is that you will see start seeing solid phases appearing here on the bottom of the magma chamber. Uh, and that's of course means crystallization, and they can be considered as, as separate cumulative layers, like kind of like in a layered intrusion. 
then uh, there may there I think there's one recharge event uh, or no I think assimilation actually starts before recharge so at some point you start to see face colors also appearing in the wall rock. And that means that then the wall rock contains some partial melt and it calculates, melts calculates phase equilibria for the, for the wall rock. So, so there's some melt present, there's probably some fluid and there are other solid phases. So it gives you the phase equilibria of the wall rock. Now it's just heating in the beginning. And then you will have two recharge events. And at that point, you will see that the melt mass will increase. So there's more melt coming into the chamber. So let's start running and I will hope to be able to explain at the same time what is happening. So there's olivine, clinopyroxene crystallizing on the bottom, mostly clinopyroxene, glacier clays comes in. Now wall rock phase equilibria is calculated. There was first recharge event and soon there will be a second recharge event as well. There you go. And you see that the mass of the wall rock is, is becoming smaller and smaller. It's the melt is being assimilated from it. And I think that's the end of the run. You can see in the end, there's also a small fluid bubble in, in, in the melt. So some fluid was exhaled during this process. Quite a lot of melt left at this point, more melt than actually we started with, which is kind of like interesting finding. Uh, and then you can follow the, the crystallization sequence of the system from these cumulants. And you can clearly see from this uh, where the recharge events were. So plasioclase already became stable here. After first recharge events, we are back crystallizing olivine and, and clinopyrex. Then as, because assimilation had started, there's SCO2 coming into the melt or the pyroxene becomes a stable phase in the magma. So you see there's all the pyroxene crystallizing. Again, the second recharge event takes us back to crystallizing olivine and, and clinopyroxene most, some spinel as well. And in the end, we have kind of like noritic rock forming here with mostly crystallization of, of plagioclase, feldspar and, and or the pyroxene. So this is what MCS can do uh, and, and what it does. And this is a tool which you can use to follow the output. And we are running the same run today. Okay, uh, just uh, some short models uh, or, or short comparison of, of the different models. Uh, how they look when we compare the in, in same diagrams, binary mixing, AFC and, and MCS. We have depleted basaltic magma assimilating average granodiuretic crust. Let's look at major elements first. Uh, we are not including AFC here because AFC is only designed for, for major elements. So we are only looking at binary mixing versus MCS. Uh, so binary mixing of magma uh, with high MGO, with wall rock with low MGO and high aluminum oxide content. And that's, of course, you just get a straight line between those. In MCS, uh, clinopyroxene starts crystallizing, we start losing MGO. At this point, plagioclase comes in, we start losing aluminum oxide from the melt. At this point, assimilation begins. So this is the, the place where well, wall rock is heated enough and molten enough in order for the assimilation to start. And for fractional crystallization, the trend would continue just this way, but assimilation takes us to another path. Aluminium does not get depleted so much because we are adding aluminium from the partially melt melting uh, wall rock. Oxide comes in here and, and you can see that how much assimilation takes place. So in the end of this run, we have a little bit more than 15% of assimilation. After that, nothing happens because magma and wall rock have reached thermal equilibrium. No more assimilation is possible unless new magma comes in into the system. So it gives you just uh, it gives you the kind of like the limit how much assimilation is possible. Here is trace elements: nickel on the x-axis, strontium on the y-axis. Again, binary mixing between magma and wall rock. Then AFC of the Paula using the partition coefficient that is average for the magma in in MCS. And you can see we can end up with very different results if we use AFC. Of the Paolo, or if we use 
MCS that takes account phase equilibria. So there's enrichment in, in strontium uh, to the end of the run in, in a, AFC, but in MCS, it's actually more depleted and there's even more depletion of strontium in the end. And this is actually not because there's, one of the reasons is, is of course that there's a lot of plagioclase crystallizing, but also there's residual plagioclase in the wall rock, meaning that much of the strontium that in AFC is actually introduced into the magma and assimilated in the magma as just bulk, you know, take this strontium, take this strontium. But in, in MCS, the wall rock doesn't want to give it strontium. It's just, you know, it's compatible to the wall rock. It's compatible to plagioclase that is crystallizing in the magma. So actually strontium contents, even when assimilation is taking place, is actually going uh, downwards in the magma. The strontium content is, is decreasing. And these kind of things wouldn't be happening without some kind of prediction of phase equilibria, taking account phase equilibria. Then we just have curves, like in the basic AFC equation. So uh, it's not only the melt uh, composition that is, this is basically the same uh, trend than, than here in the previous figure. It's not only this melt composition that you can follow in MCS, you can also follow the cumulate composition in terms of major elements and trace elements. So here you can see increase in strontium when plagioclase starts crystallizing here in the cumulate part of the, of the model. A residual wall rock can also be followed the compositional evolution of it and also the com compositional evolution of the partial melt forming in the wall rock. So all of these are mineable from the from the MCS output, if you so wish. And if, it, of course, depends what you are studying, what you are interested in studying, which of these values you are most interested in.